Okay. Uh, welcome to yet another 21st Century China Center, um, you know, a public talk. Um, my name is Victor Shi. I mean, look at this. I am uh, the Homi Lum Chair Associate Professor in China and Pacific Relations here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. Thank you for joining our discussion today. Our webinar is recorded and will be available on video and podcasts, which can be accessed on our website, china.ucsd. Edu. This is also where you would look for future events uh, by us. Please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. I'm sure there will be many. Uh, I'll be reading the questions you submit uh, to our speaker during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. Today, we're delighted to have uh, Marika Oberg uh, from the German Marshall Fund uh, and we were also going to have uh, Jessica Batke from the China File, uh, but for personal reasons, she couldn't make it today. Uh, nonetheless, she is co-author of this project, uh, and hopefully some of our feedbacks uh, will you know, go back to both Marika and Jessica to help them in their ongoing research. Uh, Marika Oberg is a senior fellow in the Asia program and co-leads the Stockholm China Forum. She's based in the German Marshall Fund's Berlin office. Uh, before joining uh, the German Marshall Fund, Marika worked as an analyst in the Mercata Institute for China Studies or Merix. Uh, many of you know it as Merix, uh, where she focused on China's media and digital policies, as well as China's Communist Party's influence campaigns in Europe. Uh, that, of course, is where Marika and I first met uh, in person. Uh, I was briefly um, a visiting fellow at Merrick's. Um, we had a lot of time hanging out on their nice terrace uh, in Berlin. Uh, I will also introduce Jessica, even though she's not here today, uh, since she's co-author. Jessica Batka is the senior editor at China File, a publication by the Asia Society. She is also primary editor of the China NGO Project, Previously, Jessica was a foreign affairs research analyst in the US State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, where she focused on modern Chinese society as well as leadership and governance, including cultural, religious, ethnic media and political trends. Um, their research is available online. Um, see, either uh, it's on the China File uh, website. Um, so Marika will present for about 25 minutes. Afterward, I will start the conversation, then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, welcome, Marika, to 21st Century China program. Thanks so much for the introduction, Victor. Very excited to be here. Um, it's evening in Germany where I'm at, but um, hi, everybody. It's, I, it's, it's 11 o'clock, I think, over there. Let me see if I can start sharing my screen so you can follow along. Okay. Yes, I think you, hopefully you can now, you can now see my screen with my presentation. Um, as Victor has said, my co-author Jessica Bapke unfortunately can't be with us tonight and I'll do my best. She did a lot of the quantitative work and I'll do my best to represent her properly, but there may be some questions that she's in a better position to answer. And in that case, I'll, I'll do my best. So what, what, what did we do here um, in, for our piece called State of Surveillance? As Victor said, you can read the whole piece on the China File website. Um, our, our, our goal here, what we set out with was basically to use openly available, but not that much used sources in order to understand China's surveillance apparatus better. Um, we wanted to answer questions such as, you know, who is being surveilled and why? What, what's the actual scope and, and how advanced is this apparatus in real life? Because you see a lot of it in the media, but some things you never quite know how advanced is this actually? How consolidated is the surveillance apparatus? Like when you read about it, often you, you get the impression that you do have this all-seeing, all-knowing eye that is centrally managed. Um, 
But if you know more about how the Chinese bureaucracy works, you, you also kind of, you, you kind of suspect that's not how it works and that there's not someone sitting in Beijing who has access to all the data. So how advanced is it? How cool consolidated is it? How much variation do we actually see across different locale, localities? And to what extent do very heavily surveilled places such as Xinjiang that have been in the media a lot, do they serve as a laboratory for the rest of China? Question mark, right? Those were all questions we wanted to <clears throat> look at. Um, the data we used in order um, to learn more about this was basically a public public procurement documents that are, were uploaded by the Chinese bureaucracy itself. So this is publicly available data, even though probably the people who were uploading it weren't exactly doing that for us. They were doing it for their own public procurement purposes. Um, all in all, we got 76,000 public procurement notices. Um, in some cases, some of them may have ended up in there twice. We reduced it down to a set of 22,000 unique notices in the end where we could say for sure this was a process that was actually finished. The, the keywords, we used two sets of keywords to arrive at these notices. First was a purchaser keyword where we made sure that we focused on the surveillance and security bureaucracy so we wouldn't scrape up data from like kindergartens or public schools that would not have been included there. And then on top of that, we used a content keyword that we ran A plus B purchaser keyword plus content keyword related to surveillance. So either such terms such as facial recognition, facial recognition cameras, video sharing platform for public security, uh, but also the names of specific surveillance projects. Um, and we ran that. And for, for, for this data set in the end, we had 7,000 attachments that were some of these notes had attachments that usually explain some of the processes in more detail. And that's where a lot of the interesting detailed data comes from. So this is just an idea of what our, or the scope of our data was. Um, for the analysis, we combined quantitative and qualitative. So how many keywords, how often did facial recognition show up? Um, how much of this is from the public procurement um, bureaucracy, how representative is a phenomenon that we actually, that we, that we discovered, um, how often does it show up elsewhere in these documents. Um, but, but by and large, a lot of these documents were just, you know, they were about the bidding process and not everything had super interesting information. So we collated some quantitative data on how much, how much there was actually put in there, but then we also used case studies to highlight some of the more detailed procurement attachments that we did find, the ones that outlined in more detail what was actually happening on the ground. And for that, we made sure, I will introduce the case studies in a, in, in a bit, but for that, we made sure that we had some local variation. Um, and we did not only limit ourselves to a data set, as you will see in the study, we also conducted expert interviews um, and had some more background information that we filled in. But the most part of it was, <clears throat> was the, the documents themselves. Um, now, the first thing, one of the first things um, we found, even though um, we excluded some purchase or keywords such as kindergarten or public school or water management bureau, it's still, even if you just look at the more strictly defined security bureaucracy, it's still not a monolithic undertaking. Um, the public security bureaucracy, public security bureaus under the Ministry of Public Security, they take charge of a lot of what is going on here about 65.8% 65 65 of our notices came from the public security bureaucracy. But on top of that, various other party and government entities are involved at both the central and the local level. Um, so it's not that you can say there is just this one bureau, this one ministry that does all of this work. Um, it's several ones, sometimes it's overlapping work. You also see this which if you know how Chinese bureaucracy works, you will be familiar with this, this campaign style buildup where equipment is purchased as part of multiple overlapping campaigns, like one the earliest 2003 safe cities, 
then a public security run called Skynet that was about equipping police with better camera systems. Then came smart cities and finally um, a project that was initially targeting urban areas to make sure that urban, sorry, apologies, rural areas to make sure that rural areas also have sufficient camera coverage called Sharp Eyes. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have you have Project Skynet Phase One, Project Skynet Phase Two. So these these took place at the same time, um, and it was part of these multiple campaigns of build up that we <clears throat> that we saw. Um, in terms of what we found, in terms of what we what was purchased, um, the various surveillance technology components. Of course, you had one one large part of this was fairly simple network cameras for achieving what is known in the Chinese bureaucracy as, as global coverage. What exactly global coverage means may differ from place to place. And I think some areas it was fairly clearly defined as at least 100 cameras per square kilometer, but this is not necessarily always um, the case. So those would be regular cameras that might be able to pick up license plates, but wouldn't necessarily be able to recognize faces. And you just make sure that your highways are lined with them, that you have all areas of your jurisdiction covered. On top of that, there were an increasing number of purchases of facial recognition cameras, which would usually involve two parts. Uh, one, of course, a camera, the, the, the front, front end camera with sufficiently high resolution. And then on the back end, you would need a program that would actually be able software running to actually recognize um, faces. On, on the right, you could see an illustration from Hangzhou that outlines the various layers of how stuff is fed into the system. You have the collection layers. Um, where key roads are covered, transit state stations are covered, where you have certain checkpoints and all that data feeding from the cameras in there. Then you have the support layer where this data is analyzed, the application layer that police can use in order to, for instance, find a specific person um, through facial recognition. And then you have the display layer where the data is output. So those were all components that would show up usually in many of these notices. So you didn't, it was obviously not just about buying cameras, but all, all the system related to it. You could see that there was demand. And I should add here, what, what we are looking at is what these Chinese, the, 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 the party and state departments want. It doesn't mean that everything works perfectly, but this is what they wanted to buy. They also request the specialized smart cameras, for instance, for measuring population density to be able to spot crowds right away once they form, for tracking moving targets. I think some of you may have seen this in the media of, you know, demonstrating how moving targets are attract in a crowd. Um, cameras for spotting suspicious behavior, high altitude thermal cameras that will give you an overview of the entire arena so that you can actually have both the on the ground cameras and then an overview of everything. In some cases, you could clearly see um, the request in the procurement documents to do racial profiling, for instance, have the ability to detect um, Uyghurs in a crowd and then send an alarm to the local police. Um, that was sometimes not everywhere, but often um, required as a feature. And then, of course, as I already said, a lot of the purchases were backend software, data sharing platforms, and so on. Now, I, I want to very briefly talk about data sharing um, because, again, we one of the one of the things that motivated us in the beginning was to find out: Do we actually have this all-seeing eye? Can someone from Beijing find out what is happening in Foshan and in Guangdong? Right? Um, and why do data sharing is clearly a goal. And you can see that in the procurement documents that it's often said, we need to share data more widely, we may, we may need to make it more available. But ultimately at this point, the system still remains fragmented. Um, you have some vertical data sharing. So for instance, public security bureaus sending data upwards from the township to say the county to the prefecture level. Um, but it often that's the prefecture level or the district level is often where it stops. And then it doesn't get handed up higher than that. Um, sometimes it does, but it's very rare. And then you have some horizontal data sharing across different departments. 
um, which is still relatively new and not, at least from the data that we had, we could gather not very widespread practice. We have one example here, um, Beijing Sharp Eye Video Sharing and Exchange Platform, which I think is fairly, I don't, I don't want to say it's the only one out there, but it's still fairly unique, this attempt to make sure that you have all the cameras controlled by different departments, including transport, including the water authority, the tourism commission, to have all that feed into a single platform and to make sure that public security and everyone actually has access to all the data. So that's a goal, but they're still getting there. It's not quite there yet. Um, I want to briefly go into some of the case studies. Um, as I said, um, where we looked in detail at some of the practices on the ground, because some of the documents, some of the attachments we saw were quite rich in, especially in describing the rationale and understanding the, if you want to call it the philosophy um, of, of, of how this is working. One example is from Xiqiao Township in Foshan City in Guangdong. We had, I should say, a lot of Foshan was very good at uploading its documents. We had a lot of documents from various districts in Foshan. Um, and one interesting one is Xiqiao, a small township um, where basically the goal was for a set of procurement notices that we looked at to build this intelligent facial recognition net that could cover all of Xiqiao in order to basically catch everyone and to be able to have an eye on everybody and know when there's trouble. Um, so there, there's a twofold approach that Xiqiao took that to me was interesting. And first was, of course, that the placement of cameras was not random, but was explicitly done in accordance with what um, the authorities called the four basic human needs, namely housing, food, transportation, and uh, the fourth one is missing, um, sorry. Um, the, the four basic needs and then the five quality of life needs, entertainment, healthcare, finance, travel, etc. Um, so the idea being all, and this is, I'm quoting from the document, all kinds, society is a collection of individuals and of the interactions among individuals. All kinds of phenomena that emerge within societies result from human interaction, violence, robbery, arson, etc. So the basic idea here is where humans live and where humans come together, there is going to be trouble. So in order to catch the trouble, we have to position the cameras where people live and interact. So in front of the houses, in front of the restaurants where they eat, um, in front of in, in train stations, etc. And this was this this um, this illustration is directly from the public procurement attachment. So this is we translated it, but this was this is an image from in there to be able to catch what everybody's doing. Um, and then the other thing that stood out here, but also was common in some other notices was a very strong focus on strangers and new people and kind of catching first entries into the jurisdiction of Xiqiao. Um, again, it's not unique. This shows up in a lot of the notices that we saw, but basically you would have a license plate recognition system that would spot license plates that would enter Xiqiao for the very first time. So you want to be able, if there's a new person entering Xiqiao for the first time, you want to get an alert at the police station that there is a new person. So that then you can follow up as there's a troublemaker or not. Um, and then you would focus on the choke points which are described in the documents as core points such as airports, train stations, um, bus stations, etc. And this to me was kind of an aha moment because I'd always assumed that even in China surveillance at like train stations would mainly be because those are crowded spots and you know you could have something happen at a crowded spot but no it's actually more than that it's a choke point by controlling these areas you know exactly who's coming in and out and the goal of this as again described in the notice was to be able to say with certainty whether a person is currently in CTL or not like when you get a request from the higher ups, is this person in CTL? You would have to be able to determine whether that person is currently in CTL or not. Doesn't mean that that's always working, but that's the goal that they're working towards. And this is very common. Um, another case study that we did in more detail was 
Shaowan County in northern Xinjiang. Northern Xinjiang is an area where there are a lot fewer ethnic minorities and more Han population than in the south of Xinjiang. Nonetheless, there is great nervousness in all of Xinjiang. By and large, surveillance is a lot more invasive and noticeable than in, as in, than in other parts of China. But what we did find was in terms of what they wanted, what authority, or authorities in, in Shawan wanted, it wasn't that different from what authorities were asking for elsewhere. Um, for instance, surveillance was done according to geometric units. I'm sorry, I don't have an illustration here. I did a crappy illustration of my own, but I didn't want to add my crappy illustrations. So you have circles. Circles would cover the entire county or the entire district, and you would check all the choke points into the circle. You would then have blocks which are defined as large units that are delineated by lakes or mountains or highways by any physical barrier. Those are blocks and you would be able to cordon those off. Below that are grids, which you may know from the term grid management, which is basically subdividing those blocks into smaller units and each person, someone is responsible for each of these grids. You would have the lines which basically refer to place lines are highways that cross Shawan County. So you would need to make sure that inside on those highways, inside your jurisdiction, you would have cameras every so and so many meters or, or miles um, and spots which are defined as areas where there's lots of people high, high, high chance of trouble, basically. And those are those units are you find in other places as well, not just in Shawan. Um, similar, you had video sharing across the three levels of government, township, county, and then one up to the prefecture. This is again, very common that you would send that up to the prefectural level. You had requests to build a societal resource integration platform, which basically means you want to be able to not just use your police cameras, but you also want to have private or non-public security video surveillance footage feeding directly to the police. So in a way, doing what Beijing did earlier with the data sharing, gathering as much private data or data controlled by other bureaucracies and making it available. But this is also, it's, it's, this happens quite often. It's not usually very advanced, but in all these, in all these, areas you could see a lot of overlap between what was happening at least in northern Xinjiang and other places in China. Same terminology, same campaigns, a lot of the same language used. So more invasive but not in a category fully on its own. Um, and the last thing I, I briefly want to address was from a case study from Xiangfang district in Harbin in northern China where we found um, some of the more advanced data analysis purchases in, in our data set, um, where the police were trying to build up key modules, for instance, key person control modules where you could collate data, mobile data, railway ticket purchases, hotel states, stays on specific individuals. Um, so you had, had this module, you would have a fund analysis module where you could reconstruct international financial transactions and search bank cards, search all the financial data. You had what was called the August analysis module where you could basically reconstruct the, the, the places a person had traveled in a day or in, in any other period. So you would have that displayed from all the images you would have collected on the specific person from that day or another period of time and could then reconstruct where did they actually go by, by timestamp, essentially. Again, doesn't mean it's working perfectly, but this is what they were aiming for. Um, there was what was known the multi, as, as the multivariate analysis module, which was basically supposed to draw connections and look for patterns between separate individuals, vehicles, and cases. So for instance, such a system would have to pick up if two individuals that otherwise aren't related or aren't marked as related in the system would show up consistently in the same place because their cell phones are spotted in the same area all the time. You would then mark these two people as linked um, in your system and would say that there is probably a connection. 
And then of course it can be used for a number of other things. And then there was one module that was used for predictive policing where existing cases were supposed to train police computers to in order to make predictions about all people to identify key persons with the potential to get involved in terrorism. And of course, much has been said about the problems and abuses and biases of predictive policing. Um, but that kind of approach was also found occasionally in the surveillance procurement documents that we analyzed. It was not all over the place, but we found beyond carbon quite a few cases of this being used. Now, I will try and wrap up so that we have enough time for our discussion. Basically, our, our key takeaways um, was, of course, purchases of today, it's, it's pretty obvious that surveillance technology purchases have gone up, have grown rapidly across China, and that Chinese officials nationwide wide view this as a critical element of government. So it's going up everywhere. Xinjiang, despite having this extreme level of surveillance, also uses the same surveillance schemes as other parts of the country. There may be some places in southern Xinjiang that are more special and more distinct, but once you go to northern Xinjiang, for example, you see a lot of the same. You still find that surveillance in China still relies on a fragmented and so far, limited system, obviously no single database contains all data. Oftentimes cities would not necessarily get all the data from their, from their districts. However, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to see here. And the system does not have to reach the level that Chinese police or public security would dream of in order to be very invasive, very agile, and actually have a very big effect on people's lives. Again, to what extent does it matter whether Beijing can actually see the physical footage of Xi Jiao if they can put in a request to Xi Jiao authorities and ask is person X, Y, Z in Xi Jiao and Xi Jiao comes back either with a yes or no, right? So that also has quite a bit of effect in potentially tracking people down. So um, I will stop here and really look forward to all your questions and to anything you, you might have to add, um, anything that was unclear. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Marika. Uh, this was really an amazing presentation and I learned a lot from it. Uh, and I highly urge uh, those of you in the audience, if you haven't done so, go to China File and read the paper. You get all the details. Uh, some of them uh, were covered by Marika, but you know, just lots and lots of interesting detail. So I will start with a couple of questions of my own. So one, the my first question is, it's very interesting that you say that the local acquisition of the surveillance equipment is coming in waves, uh, depending on these presumably centrally directed campaigns. Um, were these campaigns mandatory? So was it like, you know, local governments must buy the following equipment or did the central government, of course, sometimes would just provide fiscal incentives. It's like, if you buy this stuff, we're going to pay for 60% of it, you know, 50% of it, whether you have any indications of that. The other question I have is that, you know, we're talking about a lot of data here, right? Especially the video data is huge amount of data. Uh, is the storage and analysis of this data seen by the government as a service? You know, so because right now, you know, cloud computing is hip, you know, but it's seen as a service, it's like a utility, or are they trying to actually buy the equipment to do it themselves, right? And and to actually have their own data storage, have their own, you know, um, machine learning algorithm to analyze the data, or are they just saying that, look, we just need someone to store the data and analyze it, you know, bid for it, you know, or something like that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so about the centrally mandated, um, it's a it's a mix, I would say. Um, part. So usually, what you would have to know that these campaigns, often as many people will also know, will come in waves. From the the approaches from the spot to the line to the whole surface. So first, you pick a couple of model cities, and then you say, you model city X, Y, and Z. Here is some money that you can use to please build up this um, the surveillance system. You know, we provide some of the funds, and you are now a model city 
or you can apply to be a model study and build this up. But that doesn't mean that it usually doesn't come overnight. Usually you have several stages of this where first you have some cities that are picked for this and that are then encouraged sometimes through making available some central government budget that is mentioned in some of the procurement notices you can say where it says look we have this money available from the central government because we've been picked as a model city for project x we're going to use it this is what we're going to use it for but in most cases it doesn't say where the money comes from so it's not necessarily the case that all of this is centrally funded but it is very much it's a central enterprise that just moves in stages of getting more and more cities on board in this until you finally in the final stage have all of China covered. Now for the storage and analysis as a service. So data does get eventually, it does eventually get deleted. There's a high awareness that no, you cannot store everything forever. So usually it'll, it'll give periods for how long data has to be stored, like, you know, 30 days, nine days in case of specific, specific activities is this a service or is it owned? So the thing is, a lot of this is done by the companies, but the best thing I can say for this is that the companies will often guarantee that they will maintain the equipment for so and so many years. And then in some cases, it actually says, in the documents and after those years have passed the stuff belongs to us so that's the only thing that's the only indication that you have in terms of who does this belong to um so sometimes it's like the the, the companies provide the services for several years but then usually in many cases the government will make sure that they then in the end own the equipment that refers to the cameras i am fairly sure it also refers to some of the software, but that is less clear to me from looking at the documents. So this is definitely a question where you could eventually, you could actually find different answers across different places, depending on, on what they're, what you're, what, what they want to have. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you know, that there's variation. Uh, so the questions are coming in. Um, so early on, there were a couple of very interesting questions. One is, and this happened to me, right? So as you guys were collecting this data and publishing the results, do you find that new data on procurement is no longer being posted <laughs> because in react potentially in reaction to your work? Um, this is the badge of shame. And I will say, yes, this is, we, um, <clears throat> we, we are possibly responsible for data not being available anymore. This doesn't mean this is only this only affects one website. What happened was the whole website got taken down, <laughs> like mm. within a couple of hours of us publishing. Um, it did go back up. So you still have that data coming in. But what did happen is they delinked most of the attachments. So they used the maintenance period to delink a lot of the attachments. Doesn't mean the attachments are gone, but you cannot find them as easily anymore. You can't just find them by clicking on the link and then clicking on another link. So this is definitely a risk that you run whenever you publish um, and whenever you work with data. Um, but yeah. there is still quite a bit of similar data left, I would say. Right. Great. Um, and is there a way to, to, so another person asks like, well, maybe this is all fake or something like that. Is there a way to validate uh, somehow, you know, validate the veracity of some of this data? So, I mean, it would be quite an effort to have a whole, this is ultimately a uh, website with several million entries, which makes very specific reference to specific government departments, to specific projects. And of course, the existence of these departments and of these projects can often be verified independently. Like you can you know that these departments actually exist, that they are involved in some of this work, you can also find companies selling these types of services. So there are definitely ways to, um, to verify 
that something is actually happening. I would argue if this were all fake, they probably wouldn't have taken it off. So I'd be very surprised in the scope of it, that would be a massive deception um, that would have to be internally consistent to a degree. Again, you have several million entries there that I don't think is possible. Um, that doesn't mean that now that somebody knows that this is happening and that people are using this data, that there may not be a case where they, there might be an attempt to sneak in some false data. That's possible. And I certainly, ever since publishing, we've been treating these documents with more caution. Nonetheless, I consider them generally credible um, and, and real and not a fake effort to deceive foreign researchers. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the great things about data is that it's, it is very hard to fake a large data set. And especially if you believe that uh, the first batch of data is fairly reliable because you know people didn't realize it. you can always use the older data to to try to validate um, some of the correlations in the newer data. Uh, so other questions. So there was one about, but I think one of your there was one question from Barry about uh, the share of the procurements that are primarily related to public security versus other functionalities. But you did have a chart pie chart shown that already, right? And, and how, how, uh, how did you generate that pie chart, actually? I guess that would be a related question. So we had the pie chart. I don't think I can start sharing again, but we had the pie chart where we basically, um, we did not have all possible purchases in there. We did limit ourselves to known institutions inside the, surveillance and control bureaucracies. So, um, so departments such as urban management, such as the, the Zhang Fawei, the politics and the, the, the political legal commissions, which are, which are essentially the party body above public security and a number of others. Um, stability maintenance offices, comprehensive main management um, offices. So we did not have the full set of data in there. Um, but we essentially um, had all those offices that we know are involved. And then for, for analyzing the data, we could simply go to the purchaser data and you could compute fairly easy, easily the share of how much of each of them was actually in there. And for public security bureaus and related, it was six, a little over, it was six, roughly 66%. So quite a large chunk of it but not all of it. Um, and that's, that was a fairly easy computation to make because we had, a, we had the purchase our data um, was fairly easy to extract from the data set and then run, those num run, run that over there. Well, of course, uh, an obvious missing bureaucracy in your data was the Ministry of State Security, which probably was subsumed under the public security procurement, you know, if I had to guess, I don't know, who knows, right? I could say something about that. So there is no Ministry of State Security data in there that does not get uploaded. That would be considered a state secret. We did look for it just in case, you know, sometimes someone is stupid enough to upload something. So we, we did check for it, but there was simply not in there. Sometimes you would have data that was said Mo Dan Wei, so like a certain unit. And in that case, there may be a Ministry of Public uh, of State Security or a PLA unit behind that but you don't know that those are simply missing. And also you will see, whereas in the past, some, some companies would brag about having sold so and so many things to the Ministry of State Security. And you can see some of that information being taken offline. So it will no longer specify that they've sold to state security, um, not all over the place, but clearly this is considered sensitive information that you wouldn't upload on, on these platforms, but that is, presumably run, there are other platforms that are for military purchases, state security purchases, but those are more well protected and you can't just get at that data. Sure. Yeah, no, I think at the, trying to get some data at the company level, maybe the way to go for this kind of stuff, actually. I, I also agree with that. Um, so this, these are questions from one of our grad students who is very interested in this topic, uh, Jeff. Hoffman, um, he asked, so were you able to ascertain where the data 
is being held. So that's very similar to my question. And well, so this is more of a question about sharing with the central level, right? So you commented extensively about the township, county, and prefecture sharing data. What about data sharing with the central level? The other question is, do you attribute local variation of surveillance implementation to just an artifact of different bureaucracies, or is it more of a national uh, experiment to determine what works best? Yeah, so local versus the central dynamic. So about the storage, um, part, of, part of these purchases that will show up is storage units. It'll say, you know, we need to need, we need so and so many terabytes or hundreds of terabytes of storage for this. And then you have specified um, specifications for how long, what is kept. Um, those are, the thing is, I don't know where it's stored. Um, several documents make references to clouds. So clearly this is not necessarily stored and you know, you're not gonna build a data storage locally necessarily. So we still don't know where it's stored. We just know that this is usually done by a company, sometimes through their cloud systems and in their all their overall effort to build more storage for data. But I wouldn't be able to tell you the data for CTIAO is stored in this and that mountain or you know in this and that facility that was built by so and so. Um, just that somebody is storing it and is making it available through a relatively secure cloud. Um, that, that is usually how this is done. There may again be some variation, but this was the most common that I saw. Now about the variation, I don't know. My, my guess is you can see some duplication of language um you can see you know like the, the 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 circles and the grids and the blocks and the lines um that is used across various different places you can see some like the the four basic human needs and five entertainment needs that essentially in the data set i think we only found in Foshan. So I think it's a mixture of both. In some cases, locales will use central standards or will look to other places to see what are they doing. But in some cases, I think it's probably encouraged for local authorities to come up with new creative ways of doing this and thinking about it. And then maybe ideally even getting picked as a model for others to emulate. So it's it's that balance again of central standards, but also trying to encourage some local innovation in the hopes for them that maybe they get picked as a model. Yeah, and also I suspect um, local governments uh, near Shenzhen, where you know the tech hub is, probably more willing to innovate. You know, just because of these unspoken guanxi between local officials and, and tech people in Shenzhen. Uh, okay, so questions from uh, Professor Mark Dallas here. Um, one is, uh, this is more on the qualitative side of the research. Uh, have you found indicators that local officials are evaluated based on their ability to implement these systems uh, and also collect data uh, in certain quantities? So, you know, we, we of course do a lot of study in the Zhibiao and all this kind of stuff. Um, do procurement documents state what the purposes of the technology are for and were you able to create percentage of the expressed goals? Uh, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, yeah, well, so just a level of implementation for some of this technology. Uh, and then do you, and the third question I also wonder about, like, do you have data on which companies ultimately won these procurement contracts? So our, our local officials evaluate it by, for implementing this. We didn't find any clear indication for that, but we do know that they are definitely evaluated negatively if any trouble happens inside their jurisdiction. So they have, even if nobody, I'm sure somebody, they, they do, I'm sure they submit their success reports and say, you know, we have completed so and so many cameras in our jurisdiction and they're placed here and there. So I'm sure they have some 
duty to report on that to the higher ups, but my I haven't seen that they're evaluated by that, but I don't think that's necessary because again, they have this huge incentive to want to avoid any incident because they are clearly evaluated if any public public incident, public clash occurs inside the jurisdiction or they're found responsible for anything. So that that is all that is definitely a strong motivator here, even though it's not spelled out specifically that implementing it is 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 the basis for evaluation. Um, purpose of the tech. I mean, the, to the degree that it's spelled out in the procurement documents, the purpose of tech is kind of spelled out as this helps us solve the diff like it, I think in one in one document it literally says tech helps us solve the difficult problem of controlling people. Um, so the idea being if we only throw enough money at the tech and if only we have enough tech, then ultimately our problems will be solved. Like so that you can see some of that faith and technology and solving government governance issues. Um, but that, that those were the only only explicit references um, made to the purpose of tech. Can you repeat your third question, please? Uh, do you, is there data on who won these contracts? Ultimately? There is, you could, we could completely, we could generate that data. We didn't for the purpose of, of this paper, um, but you, we have the data, we know who won in many cases, and this is data that can be generated. Right. Oh, well, that's another topic that we need to talk about uh, afterward. I have uh, another project on more of the overseas dimension of some of these companies, uh, but it would be great to kind of merge the domestic and overseas somehow uh, using all publicly available data, of course. Uh, okay, so a couple of questions on uh, something that you uh, had worked on before at Merrick's on the social credit system. Um, is there sort of integration between the surveillance and China social credit system? So we didn't find we didn't find this as part of the surveillance data. The only social credit related data points. The thing is, we didn't. So we may have been able to look. For let me explain why we couldn't search for more explicit links throughout all the data. We couldn't because all, essentially all attachments now specify the rules according to which companies have to have sufficient social credit in order to be able to participate in the bidding process. So if we had searched for social credit related keywords, this may have actually, you know, we would have actually gotten hits on all our 7,000 attachments that outline the, the procurement procedures. Um, so I can't say with certainty that no such links exist, but I didn't come across any explicit attempts. I did not come across this in the documents that I read basically beginning to end. And I did look at quite a few, so it didn't come up there. Can't say it doesn't exist, but I would say not yet. I don't think that data is being linked yet. It's still kept separately. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I, I will just insert a quick comment here is that as someone who's doing also similar kind of work, you can't just have the data without someone like Marika who's willing to read through these actual documents from beginning to end to, to even make sense of them and to tell the more quantitative analysts uh, how to analyze these things. I, I totally agree with that approach. Uh, so another question. Um, so as you know, you know, some of these tech companies, Chinese tech companies are politicized you know, by the previous <laughs> administration in the US like Huawei and ZTE. Uh, China Mobile, do you see uh, them, you know, really playing a heavy role in this surveillance technology? Um, yes, they do. They wouldn't usually. So the thing is, you wouldn't get they wouldn't get the bidding contract most of the time. Um, so this the, the bid would the, the con like the, the, the bid would usually be awarded to like an in the middle company that then is able to get the tech components from various different companies like Huawei, like 
various other some in some cases buying the computer models because they do need to it consists of so many different parts so you wouldn't usually award the whole contract to Huawei but a lot of Huawei equipment would end up in there and there's definitely collaboration between companies like Huawei and the public security apparatus and we don't necessarily we don't even need the set of documents to know that because that's advertised quite freely um, usually by Huawei on on its Chinese language sources um, so we definitely know that is the case and I am personally um, I think that's definitely something we should keep in mind um, when evaluating these companies overall, just like I would definitely, like in the process, I definitely kept an eye out for equipment from major Western companies because it would be of interest to me if, you know, all the computers for a system that is put up in Shaowan, Xinjiang come from Western company X, that would be of interest to me and I would want to follow up on that, right? And in a similar way, it's also relevant to me if Huawei or any other Chinese company is heavily implicated in that. Um, we didn't, again, because we didn't look too much at companies in this particular round, we didn't find that much, but I'm sure you could find quite a bit of data on both major Chinese global companies and Western companies. They wouldn't get the bid, but their their equipment would be, would be used in this. Yeah, so one uh, thing that I've seen in the past a lot is that the the underlying technology comes from Huawei or you know Zeman or you know whoever, uh, but the company that wins the bid is some obscure local company you know which happens to be owned by the cousin of the local police chief or something like that. So you could see a lot of that. So you know from your data you can see a pattern of like the equipment coming from these big tech firms, but then the actual winner is like some obscure company you could potentially have some metric of corruption you know in, in uh help the chinese government out you know catch the bad apples you know i, I know you've always wanted to do that marika always no i think i think that's you probably find something like that though some of the companies that get the the bids like that that get awarded the bids they're not that obscure so you have a broad variation in there but it would definitely be it would be interesting to see, for instance, are local companies picked? Or if not, why are they not picked? And this is definitely um, questions that could be answered by looking at some of the data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a couple of questions on privacy. Um, is there any concern of privacy protection from people or established by the government or any cases of leaked personal information that draw people's uh, or the government's attention to a lot of this surveillance technology. Um, can you, I'm not sure I fully understood. So, um, yeah, so there are a couple of questions like this. Like one, one was like, well, you found this data on all the surveillance technology, do the Chinese public know about it? And uh, are they worried about it? And are they worried about it because of a case where, you know, a lot of personal information collected by the Chinese government got leaked to, you know, third party company or some scammer or something like that. So I don't like the data that we worked with. I don't know that the extent is widely known in China, like the technical details, even though it's theoretically available on the internet, I don't have a sense that this is information that is widely known or shared um, among the public. I do know separately, unrelatedly, yes, there are concerns about data breaches of personal data, um, which when, when the Chinese government or China official media address that, they like to say those are always private company that leak that data, but in some cases, like in some data leak cases that have been discussed in Chinese media, it's fairly obvious that the source of the data was probably a government that sold it, but that's then not addressed in the media. So you have the problem of 
how many you can't really tell how many people know of this how do people think about this um i do know from separate research not representative but from separate research i did on the social credit system where um researchers at the university of trier and i they did a survey among chinese students concerns about the social credit system where interestingly the finding was that they were more concerned about government surveillance than private company surveillance private company abuse of data um, they were more concerned about the government which was given how large how much how much of a campaign there has been about data abused by private companies, it was kind of surprising to find that the government was still the bigger concern. But it's it's essentially impossible to make to, to, to give you exact because we can't do those public opinion surveys. I wish we could, but I don't see myself doing them. And it's I think it's very difficult. Well, that's case. something that we we can do that here with uh, we, we have an ongoing uh, survey series. I mean, it's an online survey, so it's not perfect. Uh, but privacy certainly is an interesting topic for uh, exploration. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we're running low on time, but let's get uh, at least one more question here. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Barry has another question. Um, are smart cities rollouts prominent? in lots of different cities you covered. Do heightened public security surveillance programs rolled out as part of a generalized smart uh, city program? Uh, oh yeah, so so yeah, our, our, our heightened, I guess that makes more sense, our heightened public security surveillance programs rolled out as a part of a smart city program. Uh, yeah, so, so is the smart city program, is it one of the campaigns that you mentioned or is it something bigger or, you know? Um, I would have to look up the exact numbers on all the keywords and Zhihui, so Zhihui Changshi, but then you also have Zhihui and place name. Um, so I don't know, I have the numbers ready, but it's definitely something that is not limited to an area, it's, it's across um, China. Sometimes smart and safe city are used in the same project description, um, but it's, 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 it's a label that it is used quite commonly in procurement headlines, documents from public security and related, um, related bureaucracies. Great. Uh, okay, final, final question from uh, Tenzin Norgay. Um, any sign of foreign companies? I mean, you talked about this already. Uh, have, have, are you in the process of nailing some major Western companies uh, getting very involved in this field? So the thing is that in this area, in facial recognition technology, Chinese companies are actually really, really good. They're actually ahead of many Western companies. So a lot of the more advanced technology, it's not necessary to go to foreign companies. You can use Chinese companies because they're simply either the best or playing amongst the best. So for, um, for we, we did some other projects, like we looked at um, DNA analysis and genomic surveillance. And there it's super clear that certain components they need to buy from Western companies and they cannot do it without and therefore these Western companies are pretty much always involved in selling that. You don't have that same issue to my knowledge in the surveillance sector, unless you count certain computers, certain hardware where you might still, for the basic stuff, might still use Western companies. But for the more advanced stuff, you have more definitely Chinese companies play the biggest role and there's no such dependence on any Western company as you would find in DNA analysis or some other fields. And of course, there are Taiwanese chips uh, in everything. Um, so Marika, thank you for being with us today. Uh, please stay in touch. Uh, and also I'd like to thank the audience for being with us uh, and uh, sign up for our updates. Uh, and the webinar again will be available on video and podcasts. The next uh, webinar will be February 4th at 5 p.m. Pacific time, where we are going to hear from Andrea Gizelli on China's quest to protect its interests overseas. 
Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marika, and I'll see you all soon.